Hey guys, welcome back to Pop Em Up Chem. In this video, we're going to be looking at entropy. It's a concept that is often misunderstood, but I think with a few simple explanations, we can start to decipher it and also calculate it. First though, quick question on the electron affinity of calcium. Pause the video and have a little go at this paper one question. Hopefully then you remember that electron affinity is the enthalpy change when one mole of a gaseous atom gains one mole of electron forming the minus ion. And so if we look at our list, we can see that that is going to be C. So to begin, we need to think about spontaneity. So a reaction is spontaneous when it is able to keep going after we've put activation energy in and it keeps itself going. It's self-sustaining without an external energy input. So some reactions are spontaneous at all temperatures, you know, anything above zero Kelvin, but many other reactions become spontaneous above certain temperatures and other reactions can also become spontaneous below certain temperatures. Now that's determined by the Gibbs free energy of the reaction, which we're going to be looking at in the next video. Now, Gibbs free energy is given by the equation delta G, which is Gibbs free energy equals delta H minus T delta S. Now, we've already looked at delta H in many different ways in this unit, and we know what temperature is, but there is this term on the right hand side, delta S, which we have yet to look at, and that is entropy. And that's what we're going to do in this video. So what exactly is entropy? Well, entropy helps us explain why reactions go one way and not the other way. For example, why does ice melt in ambient temperature instead of becoming more ice? It's often described as a measurement of disorder. But this sometimes doesn't really help us visualize what that actually means. So we're going to try and describe it here using probability. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw two shapes. And we're going to say that these represent two solids that are joined by five bonds, four atoms joined by five bonds. And we are then going to add individual pieces of energy. And I'm going to represent these with an arrow. I'm going to add five pieces of energy. And we're going to say that this is a closed system with solid A and B. So we're going to think about how we could spread these five energy units out. And to do that, I'm going to replicate the system and we're going to compare two different examples of how we spread this energy out. So if we think in the first example, putting all of our energy into the B molecule. And in the second example, I'm going to distribute three pieces of energy in the B molecule and two pieces of energy in the A molecule. These both represent different microstates, which is in a moment, the energy could be in any of these configurations and it can switch backwards and forwards. But if we think about how this energy could transform and could move in any given moment, and we think about transferring energy from one bond to another bond, it's much more likely for energy to be spread out than it is to be concentrated on one molecule. Take an example of thinking about a bag of sweets of different colors or mixed nuts. If you shake a bag of different colored sweets, would you expect them all to end up in different colored layers? The likelihood of that is obviously extremely unlikely. And the same goes true for microstates. It's much more likely that all of the energy spreads out than it is all being concentrated on one molecule. Now, this is a very simple example. However, it shows how entropy can be considered a measure of the spread of energy. Low entropy is where all of the energy is concentrated in one place and high entropy is where the energy is distributed. And when we consider systems that are actually much more like real life, much larger systems like the melting ice block, the number of molecules and the amount of energy present is so large that the probabilities of entropy decreasing become incredibly small. 
Now that means for closed systems, which is going to be the vast majority of systems we study at IB, the entropy can only remain fixed or increase. So first let's look at some general examples before we look at quantitative calculations. For example, if we have a solid that is transformed into a gas, then that will be an increase in entropy because we are increasing the amount of disorder or better said, the spread of energy. We can include liquids in this continuum. If we have separate pure substances that then transform into becoming a mixture, we also increase entropy. We can summarize low entropy and high entropy by saying that in general, low entropy systems are pure substances, slow moving particles with small distances between them. There aren't as many particles and maybe more solids. Whereas high entropy, we would say more likely to be mixtures, fast moving particles with a large distance between them with more particles and they're more likely to be gases. The units for entropy are joules per Kelvin per mole. Couple of quick questions then before we look at calculating this. First question then, define entropy. Pause the video. Pop them up. So you could have defined entropy as a measurement of disorder or a measurement of energy spread. What are the units of entropy then? Pause the video. Pop them up. The units of entropy are indeed joules per Kelvin per mole. Now we can actually quantify this change by looking at the standard entropy change by using the thermodynamic data that is on table 12 and the equation, the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants. So we use this column on the right hand side and we quite simply fill in the values for whatever reaction we have. So let's try that for the cracking of pentane. And we're going to find the entropy of the reactants, which is 261 joules per Kelvin per mole, as is shown in the column. And we're gonna find the entropy of our products, which is gonna be 220 plus 270 joules per Kelvin per mole. And then we just plug those values in. So the total of our products is 490. So we're going to do 490 minus the reactants, which is 261, which equals plus 229 joules per Kelvin per mole. And we could expect that because we've gone from one mole of a liquid in the reactants to two moles of gases in the products, increasing the number of particles and the phase increases the entropy too. Time for you to have a go. I'm going to put the entropy values up on screen so you don't have to use the data booklet, but you could also use that as well. First question, find the entropy change for this reaction, the cracking of hexane. Pause the video to have a go at that. Pop them up. So remembering our entropy change is equal to the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants. So it's going to be 220 plus 310 for our products minus 295 our reactants, which is 235 joules per Kelvin per mole. Again, something we'd expect considering the increase in the number of particles and the change from liquid to gases in the products. Okay, so have a go at calculating the entropy change for this combustion reaction then. Pause the video and have a go. Pop them up. So again, we're gonna do the same calculation as we did last time. That's the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants. A Little bit more difficult because we have to take the number of moles into account, but still not too bad. We've got the products. We're gonna do two times 213.8 plus three times 188.8, which is our products minus 230 plus 3.5 multiplied by 205. Adding that all together, we get 46.5 joules per Kelvin per mole. 
Now we might have guessed a slight positive value as we only have 4.5 moles on the left and 5 moles on the right, even if they are all gases. Okay, so no practical to go with this. However, there is a worksheet with some practice questions as usual. Once again, thanks for joining me guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and as always, practice makes slightly better.